Welcome everybody and good morning. It's fantastic to see you here. And uh, I'm Leah Skews. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Interacting Minds Center. And uh, <coughs> Interacting Minds Center uh, is actually paying for all of this. So thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, today we'll, um, we'll be discussing uh, how you can use the category of gender in research and uh, what <coughs> kind of precautions you need to take uh, when, um, <coughs> in order to not sort of um, interpret the, your results too stereotypically or enforce stereotypes uh, via your research. Um, but I'll um, hand the mic on to Emma, who is the other organizer of the workshop. Okay. Hi, my name is Emma von Essen and I'm a um, postdoc in economics here at Oris University. And today's workshop titled, uh, When is Gender Measurable? Uh, we will have two keynote speakers and two commentators. And the first keynote speaker, uh, she's a professor in economics from the University of Boston, Massachusetts. And you can see she has taken on lately or uh, recently the, the ungrateful task of uh, discussing economists' measure of gender or the, gen the measures of gender that economists use and actually saying that this, there might be a problem here, you might interpret it problematically, it might lead to an exacerbation of norms and stereotypes, for instance. So uh, very well, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, warm welcome to Julie Nelson. So look up. <coughs> and after her talk, we will hear comments from Mikhail Valentin. So. Stuff here. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and many thanks to uh, Emma and Leah for organizing this, and for all of you to, for showing up. So I, I am an economist, but I'm going to be venturing into fields here that I have uh, 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 not been formally trained in, uh, philosophy, uh, linguistics, uh, other sorts of areas. Um, give you a little bit of background. I, I came to economics and I came to feminism both in the 1970s. And during that time, there was quite a lot of awareness about uh, stereotyping and the narrow uh, ways of thinking that stereotyping could get us uh, into. Um, I decided to do a feminist uh, critique within economics, did my PhD in economics. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, I started writing about uh, the biases in economics itself, in definition and methodology. Um, uh, including things like about the narrowness of the image of, of rational economic man as a self-interested uh, optimizer uh, at all times. Now, more recently, a field has developed in economics called behavioral economics, which does move away from this image of economic man uh, and says, you know, how do people actually make decisions rather than how would they logically if they optimized in a, a calculus sort of way. So in some sense, that's progressive. Uh, but on the other hand, I started seeing behavioral economics research come out about gender that seemed to reinforce some of the same stereotypes we questioned back in the 70s. So that's how I got into looking into this area. So I'll kind of give you, you know, as I go along, the story about how I started uh, investigating this. Um, but I had to go into other fields other than my own, and there's no way I can give this talk without repeating the blindingly obvious to some of you. Um, and probably losing uh, uh, other folks. But just so I get an idea, how many people here have taken at least one university class in statistics? Okay, so Red Hat. Um, how many people do more textual analysis, language, qualitative uh, work? And how many people do raise their hand both times? Okay, a few, so. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm in the middle there, but I'll try to make the talk accessible on, on uh, both sides, because that's un I mean, they should be mixed more. Uh, as part of my, uh, my shtick, um, but uh, they generally have not been. So let me give you, um, uh, is the sound okay? You can hear me, uh, let me know if I'm, I'm talking too loud or, or too soft. Um, just a quick outline of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about the issue about gender and risk in economics. Uh, a couple classifications I've called GDI for gender difference at the individual level, which is categorical classification. Uh, then I'll go on to talk about gender difference at the aggregate level, or you could also think of group or distributional level, uh, which is what we actually get from quantitative research. 
I'll talk about some statistical and metaphorical tools for expressing uh, both difference and similarity, which is not usually done. People usually do one or the other. Uh, and then I'll talk some about confirmation bias and publication bias in the economics research literature, uh, including one case that, that I think could be classified as economics malpractice um, in terms of distributing uh, stereotypes out there. Uh, a few extensions, things I think are fascinating in the research, but I've barely gotten into at all, but I hope we'll get into more this afternoon and then a, a conclusion. So what's the issue? I started seeing this, this kind of statement all over the place in economics. Women are more something rather than men. Um, particularly women are more risk averse than men, uh, but there's also literatures out there, women are more cooperative, women are more altruistic, women are more math phobic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I started saying, what, what does that actually mean? At face value, it would seem to mean like, you know, all men are one thing and all women are the other. And certainly I've seen people interpret it that way. And secondly, when people make that kind of claim, what evidence are they basing it on? And how does that evidence relate to the actual statement? Uh, examples of these, I mean, this was just a, a sample of this behavioral economics literature. Gender Differences in Preferences, Journal of Economic Literature, one of the main journals of the American Economics Association. Uh, they claim that they have found, quote, fundamental gender differences in risk aversion, um, altruism, and competition, I think, were the three they looked at. Gender, uh, gender differences in risk taking, why do women take fewer risks than men? And then ones that seem to appeal to particular natures of girlhood or womanhood. Girls will be girls, especially among boys. Will women be women? Okay, there's something about the essential nature of men and women that seems to be looked at here. And then lastly, a strong evidence for gender differences in risk taking. Uh, this is just a small sample of some of the titles from this literature. So crucial to my story is that there are two kinds of statements going on here. Women are more risk averse than men. That's what gets the title, that's how th these things get summarized. Where does that statement come from? Actually phrasing it correctly given the data that it is based on. What these articles actually find is that in our sample, which is usually a bunch of undergraduates at a university in an industrialized country, <laughs> um, we found a statistically significant difference. Uh, I'll stop for a minute. Statistically significant does not mean important or substantively uh, significant. Uh, you could have, say, a 100-point you know, exam and men and women score differently on average in a statistically significant way, the difference could be uh, an 18th of a point. And in a large enough sample, that could be statistically significant. That is generalizable to a, a, a population. But it says nothing about the substantive or economic uh, uh, size of the difference. So in our sample, we found a statistically significant difference in mean risk aversion, or it could be median or some other statistic, but usually average risk aversion. Uh, between men and women using some particular elicitation procedure. Uh, in a lot of cases, these are uh, lottery experiments. They bring a bunch of students into a computer lab and say, would you rather have you know, $100 for sure or $60 with 50% you know, uh, probability? You know, or, you know, $200 with 50% prob probability. And then they vary the probabilities uh, to make this more or less uh, risky. Um, uh, some of them have also used survey questions. Um, do you feel like you're a risk taker or not? Or you know, when I give investment advice I, you know, on a scale of one to five, how risky, uh, how much risk do I take? Uh, a few things are from things like uh, uh, evidence like retirement portfolios. Uh, how risky are those portfolios? But if you think about it mostly in terms of lottery sorts of questions, uh, that's, that's the bulk of this literature. And then with women on average being more risk averse. So whatever this measure is, women on average tend to score uh, lower. And this is the evidence, uh, uh, what the evidence actually uh, comes from. But statements A and B are actually very different. And statement B actually only applies to a small subset of the literature. There's a lot of literature out there actually making statement A without even having statement B, which is even more shocking than making statement A based on statement B. Why we should care um, motivate uh, the talk, as economists would say. Uh, one of the first 
uh, things is just accuracy and honesty in research and public communication. It just kind of pisses me off that people make statements that have nothing to do with actual research that they did. This is bad quality research. And I really am a social scientist at heart. I would like us to do good social scientists, the science and make statements that are um, uh, justifiable from some kind of evidence. Uh, but there's also, uh, on a more political level, equity and efficiency issues in the treatment of individuals in employment, uh, investment advice, and the rest of this. Some of these people say women are more risk averse than men say, and that's why women don't get to the highest levels in corporations. They're just not willing to take the kind of employment risks that get people to the top. Okay, so it becomes a justification for uh, wage differentials. Or women should have different kinds of investment advice because they're more cautious, etc. Or, you know, men, that men should be taking more risks. And another part that I've been interested in a lot, but I'm not going to get into here because I think it takes us too far afield, is that if we think of economics, uh, commerce, investing as masculine realms, and we think that the manly thing to do is to take risks, that could get us into a lot of trouble. Uh, financial crisis, climate change, uh, other issues like that. So those are some big deals, but not ones I'm going to talk at length about today. So let me uh, get into, um, so I, I started talking about, th these are kind of awkward acronyms, um, but I realized that people tend to confuse these things. Questions? Uh, yes, um, I, know, I don't know if you're leaving the risk area right now, but I'm just thinking about what is your take on gambling and why there are a lot more men uh, in, what we would call Lithuania, is it called that in English too? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Has a lot of your family. Okay. I might come back to that at the end. Okay, yeah, okay, you don't yeah. have to, but yeah. I'm just, that's what uh -huh. you just said. Uh, maybe more okay, I am going to be talking about risk all the way uh, through okay, here. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, okay, so the uh, risk is the specific case of the things I'm talking about. But gender difference at the individual level is uh, what I think a lot of people have uh, in their heads when we start talking about gender difference. It makes an easy um, sort of go to image of what. Uh, what gender difference is about. And so I think of this as it's binary in all of this literature. All of this literature, if somebody declines to check off male or female on the appropriate survey box, uh, their data is simply thrown out. Um, there is no scope for uh, questioning uh, ge the gender binary in the particular kind of research uh, that I'm looking at. And uh, gender differences at the individual level should be gender differences that you can pick out uh, with uh, a sample size of two. One man, one woman, they're different. 100% of women are one way, 100% of men are the other. Uh, a simple case is if you define men and women by a chromosomal pattern, which you don't necessarily have to do, uh, but a lot of people do, uh, then you have a tautological uh, gender difference at the individual level. Uh, men have a Y chromosome, women don't. Perfect zero, one, 100% of women, 100% of men uh, by that definition. Now, this isn't really, the point I'm making is not a nature-nurture point so much as a statistical uh, point. <coughs> so, for example, you can think of GDI, gender differences at the individual level, also occurring for things that have nothing to do with uh, any uh, real sex base, but have to do with cultural standards. In a very traditional society, you might have 100% of the women uh, having long hair, 100% of the men having short hair. You would statistically observe that. Uh, GDI doesn't make for very interesting social science research because this kind of stuff is usually obvious to everybody. You don't go out and do research about who wears the burqa, right? You, know, you kind of know that before you do it, so there's not a lot of research. But this sort of picture of gender, I think, is very um, uh, uh, important in how people think about gender difference. And uh, I don't know if this book got, is as popular in Europe as it was in the US, but the idea that men are from Mars, women are from v Venus, uh, two entirely different species, just really set apart, you know, male brain, male female brain, um, uh, different conversational styles, different emotional orientations, uh, everything else. Um, so the Mars versus Venus uh, metaphor is a good metaphor for this idea that uh, men and women are just categorically uh, different. But the thing I found interesting when I was looking into um, uh, gender and metaphor, actually back uh, 20, 30 years ago, is how uh, gender apparently um, 
is an important binary we use in our brain. Now, this is not a story about male versus female brains. This is a story about how gender is a uh, structuring uh, aspect. That we tend to, when we see certain kind of information, bring them in and categorize them according to existing uh, binaries in our brain. And these categories have to do with what philosophers and linguists talk about as uh, generics and essentializing. Uh, so for example, uh, here's an abstract shape. And here's another abstract shape. Do you gender those in your head? Most people will. The angular one will seem more masculine, the kind of encompassing one uh, more feminine. Um, cats and dogs. Most European American culture, dogs are considered somehow more masculine, cats more feminine. Cats are obviously male female, cat owners, male dog owners, male female. But there's this cultural cognitive gendering. Uh, one of my favorites is odd and even numbers. <laughs> there was a recent study that found some tendency among people to gender uh, odd and even numbers. Uh, which one do you think even numbers is? Which gender? Female, odd, male. Uh, the Pythagoreans uh, thought that odd numbers were more male because they could not be penetrated by the number two. <laughs> okay. So I'm not talking, obviously not talking about males and females here, I'm talking about brain sorting, that somehow we have these associations between very abstract things and gender. Now this next slide I show with some trepidation because I'm not sure about the quality of these kinds of brain scan research. But at least one of them, uh, people doing some MRI research, uh, noticed that our brains seem to function differently when we're making stereotype consistent uh, judgments versus when we're forced to go against those kinds of gender categories uh, we have in our brains. Um, but this is not my particular area of research, so I'm just going to uh, mention that. Generics and essentialism, I had to do some reading in philosophy, uh, linguistics, and psychology on this. Uh, three uh, readings from these, these three areas that I looked at. Um, a generic term is a term for a, a, a big category uh, or kind that we assume has some kind of commonality uh, in it. Um, and we essentialize, uh, this is a quote from uh, Leslie, we essentialize a kind if we form the tacit belief that there is some hidden, non-obvious and persistent property or underlying nature shared by members of that kind, which causally uh, grounds their common properties and dispositions. So for example, uh, a generic statement could be tigers have stripes. Okay, it's something that we think is common to tigers. In fact, we've created the category tigers from that. We're not necessarily too concerned if there's an albino tiger. Okay, once in a while something could still be a tiger, not have stripes. We consider us uh, being striped to be a characteristic, defining characteristic of tigerhood. Interesting things about generic statements is they can communicate a presumed essence. That presumed essence is commonly generalized to all individuals within that category or kind. But this is not related to statistical prevalence. And this is kind of my major point here, the difference between generics and statistics. Um, let me give you an example from one of these pieces. Uh, ducks lay eggs. <clears throat> true or false statement? Most people would say true. It seems to be a, a, a characteristic of ducks as a species that they lay eggs. You know, mammals have live birth, uh, whatever. Most people would say that that is a, a true statement. It's a little trickier. Quacky is a duck. Quacky lays eggs. Is that true or false? Here you might get a little bit more suspicious. Question? Depends on the sex. Of yeah, now here you might get a little bit more suspicious. Uh, but one of these, uh, the, the article from which I got this, found some tendency of people to agree with this. I mean, you just agreed with the fact that ducks lay eggs. Quacky is a duck. Maybe quacky also lays eggs. Uh, what about this statement? Danes are right handed. True or false? <laughs> Generic statements communicate a presumed essence that is commonly generalized to individuals, not statistical prevalence. Ducks lay eggs, as usually is accepted as true. Actually, less than 50% of ducks lay eggs. <laughs> they have to be female and they have to be mature. So all duck chicks and all male ducks do not lay eggs. So less than 50% of ducks lay eggs. What about Danes being right-handed? Probably upwards of 80 or 90%. 
but we don't take that statement. Okay, so the essentializing statements are about char characteristics assumed to be uh, uh, an essential part of that kind. They're not about statistics. Um, so the idea of essences then is really something about beliefs. It's about the way our minds work. They're a priori mentally created beliefs. Uh, they're not statistical facts. And there's some interesting psychological research on how much evidence you need to um, add to your beliefs about essential characteristics uh, of a kind. Turns out a sample size of two uh, is sufficient. Yeah. Uh, this, this article had um, men and women come into the lab and uh, guess the number of dots on a piece of paper. And they were told they were either an overestimator or an underestimator. And the people were paired. And if they came in cross-sex peers, and one was considered told they were an overestimator, the other one an underestimator, in a later survey, they were more likely to say, women tend to be overestimators and men tend to be underestimators, you know, just from being paired on one thing. And of course, the test was absolutely meaningless. There was no tendency uh, by gender to, to over or under guess. But we tend to uh, create and elaborate these categories uh, pretty much endlessly. So let's go back to that statement, women are more risk averse than men. Um, that's not a statement about statistics. Expressed in this kind of form, it's a generic statement, a bald statement, un bald meaning, meaning unnuanced in any way. It's a generic statement, and it's likely to be taken as confirmation of a gender essence, uh, whether a researcher uh, intends this or not. Now, does the researcher intend it? I think some of the researchers that I'm look, uh, whose work I'm going to look at, I uh, just think of this as a shorthand. They know they've done the statistics, they know what the statistics say, but this is just you know, the easy, common way to express this. So that might be an excuse for expressing it this way. Um, I think that excuse should not be accepted because I think it's misleading to the public. Plus, as I'll get on to later in my talk, there's pretty good evidence that a lot of the researchers themselves believe this generic statement before they start their research and look for results that confirm it. Uh, so it's a lot more complicated uh, than, uh, than one might, than just a, a simple uh, shortcut. So let's go on to statistics. Uh, what I call GDA, gender difference at the aggregate level, you could say group level or distributional level, uh, looks quite different from GDI. GDI is men over here, women over here, two distinct categories. Here's a couple graphs from actual data that I've looked at on risk taking. Uh, you see a lot of overlap here. This first study was from um, Beckman and Menkoff. Uh, a bunch of investment advisors were asked, uh, when you give investment advice, do you tend to um, you know, go for a lot of risk, which would be six, or be very, uh, you know, risk shy, which would be one. Uh, women uh, are the pale bars, male are the uh, dark bars. Uh, what do you see there? You see only men in the number six category. You also see only men in the number one category. And you see a mixture of men and women in the categories uh, two, three, four, and five. There is some difference, I'll come back to what the mean, there is a difference in means here. And you see some difference in the distribution. The heights of the bars are different. But you also see an over awful lot of overlap. If I told you that somebody is a two, can you tell me what sex they are? No. I mean, it's, it's virtually identical uh, in there. So it's very far from being that binary category. There's a difference here, but there's also a lot of similarity, a lot of overlap. This is, oh dear, the bottom of the slide got cut off here. That's interesting. Um, this one, the dark bar is males, the paler bar is females. This is a, a, a kernel density plot of uh, uh, bets in the investment game. This is 100% uh, of, an, of an endowment here, 0% of an endowment here. This is a game in which people are given a certain amount of money and they can either keep that amount of money or um, uh, put it into a, a risky uh, lottery. So they can you know, double or nothing, uh, whatever. Um, and this is, uh, they're, they're both, both male and female distributions tend to be somewhat bimodal. 
um, the man uh, um, investing 100% of their money or 50%, women 50%, fewer 100%, but there are women uh, investing 100%, and there are men investing uh, uh, a zero, uh, just keeping the sure thing. So again, a lot of, there are, the, the two lines are different, they, they diverge from each other, but they're also over the same range. Uh, there's a lot of overlap and, and similarity. So when we have gender difference at the aggregate or distributional level, uh, first thing to note is that there is a variation within each gender as well as across gender. That is, all the women and are not acting the same way here, all the men are not acting the same way. There's variation within each sex on the variables. The distributions overlap, showing some degree of similarity. You can find uh, men and women, both men and women in a lot of the categories here. The distributions have some degree of difference. You can see that those bars, everything doesn't quite line up. And that difference can be summarized in statistics such as differences in the mean or average values. Um, but the measured difference does not apply to individuals. You cannot accurately predict behavior from the individual's gender or gender from behavior. Okay? You can have some probabilistic guesses. It looks like uh, a lot of women put in 50%, but if a woman puts in 80%, 100%, 0%, that's also quite possible. And you can't tell where a man's going to be. You can't judge their sex from their bet. You can't judge their bet from their, uh, their sex. So this is the kind of evidence that this statement accurately comes from. In our sample, we found a statistically significant difference in mean risk aversion between men and women using a particular elicitation procedure with women on average being more risk averse. That's the kind of data it comes from, not GDI, but these overlapping distributions. So rather than take that kind of distributional data and say women are more risk averse than men, what are some more accurate ways of uh, expressing this more statistically uh, uh, sophisticated result? Now, people in psychology, this is old hat uh, for economists. Uh, it seems like behavioral economists had not heard about this until I wrote a 2012 working paper uh, citing 20-year-old you know, research in psychology. Um, to, to bring it in, uh, but there's a measure of what's called effect size. This is a measure of the substantive size of a difference. Um, you take the uh, X bar M is the male mean value, uh, X bar F is the female mean value, and this is a uh, measure of the pooled standard deviation, which fancy formula is down here. But what it does is gives you the difference um, in standard deviation units. So D is going to be bigger, the bigger the absolute difference is between the male and female means. And it's going to be smaller the more variation there is among men and among women. So you could have a big difference on the mean between men and women, but if you also have a big difference among men and a big difference among women, it's not going to be such a big deal. This is probably best explained with a couple pictures. If we assume that um, the distributions are good old normal bell curves, uh, this is what these things uh, uh, look like. Um, the may, we know that uh, women's height distribution is shifted to the left of men's. Uh, we know that there are women who are as tall as, um, uh, there's a range of tall women and short men that overlap. Oops, sorry in here, it's fairly rare to find women taller than the average man or men shorter than the average woman. Um, so these could be distributions of rough uh, indications of the height distribution. This corresponds to a Cohen's D value of about 2.6, uh, which is to say there's about two and a half standard deviations between those two uh, means. Oh, uh, what if D was a lot smaller? Suppose D was down about a third of a standard deviation, 0.35. Yes, there's a difference between the male and female means, but there's a whole lot of overlap here. Okay, here the distributions are very close uh, uh, together. Now, not all distributions are going to are normal bell curve distributions, uh, but this gives a, a, just a nice visualization of what this looks like. Um, I like to keep that 2.61 in mind 
Um, there is some discussion about what makes, what's a big or a small size of Cohen's D. And sort of within psychological research, they said, well, D of, of 0.8, uh, the guy Cohen said, let's call that large. And for certain kind of psych studies, that's large if the, among, you know, among researchers who understand this, that might be large. I tend to think of, for communication to the public, you probably want, wouldn't want to use large until you get D at least you know, up around here. Heights are something we can all observe. People can kind of figure out that these are distributional, that women have various heights, men have various heights, there's overlap. Um, so if you say, you know, it's, the difference is bigger than heights, smaller than heights, uh, throwing velocity and throwing distance are also up around uh, this kind of number, d point something. So these are physical uh, attributes that people have a pretty good, I think, intuitive sense about. Yeah, I, on the height one, I always just love to add in that it's, it's still culturally specific, because if you, it, it's not going to work as a distinct or if you're comparing yeah. A population of very short people to a population of yeah. extremely tall people. Yeah. No, this is, I'm going to get on to uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, ethnic biases at the end in the extensions. This was obviously US or uh, US and European um, uh, kind of data. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm belaboring the point about <laughs> overlap here to the neglect of some of the other things that are also uh, very interesting. Um, some nice, uh, another way besides pictures to try to, to express what uh, effect size means is, um, uh, here's some, some, oops, sorry, uh, some common ways of interpreting it. For example, of, um, you know, a Cohen's D of three, three standard deviations is big, and virtually all the women will score below the average man. You could guess someone's sex by their score, that is, a score above the mean is very likely to be a, a man, 93% accuracy with that. Uh, common language effect size, probability that a randomly chosen man and woman, so you pull out a random pair of men and women, the man would score higher, that would be 98%. That's when D equals three, that's a big one. What if D equals, say, 0.3? Oops, sorry, keep on hitting the wrong button there. Uh, 0.3. Well, actually, if it's zero, if there's no difference between men and women, then the chance of a uh, uh, percent of women who score below the average man is 50%. It's always 50% below the mean. Okay. Um, if D goes up to 0.3, 62%, uh, you can guess the sex of a person by their score with 56% accuracy. That's better than 50% accuracy, but that's not a whole lot. And uh, was it 58%? Uh, if you randomly paired a man and a woman, it would be a 58% chance that the man scores higher than the woman. A little higher than 50%, but again, you know, not overwhelming. So I'm going to come back to common language uh, effect size uh, in a minute. Um, and an important piece I have to, uh, to mention, uh, g going apart from risk, um, uh, Janet Shibley Hyde's uh, 2005 piece, The Gender Similarities Hypothesis. She, um, is, that's where I first heard about Cohen's D. She calculates Cohen's D uh, from meta-analysis of quite a lot of studies. Take a look at the kind of size of these numbers. We hear a lot about, oops, <laughs> differences in, say, mathematics scores. Okay, yes, men have an advantage of 0.06 of a standard deviation in some of these studies. So if you look at the signs of these, negative sign means women score higher. Okay, so the girls score somewhat higher on reading comprehension, the, the boys sco uh, score higher on math. That's stereotype consistent. If you look at the size of those D values, and they are, they are tiny. That is, you know, if, you, if you plotted those distributions, you would not be able to, to see the difference. You would have to do the calculation to find a six one hundredths of a standard deviation difference. Um, another tool before I get back to risk uh, and this one I uh, invented um, for categorical data. Uh, when you have a limited number of categories, maybe two categories, five categories uh, in your data, um, you can uh, calculate an index of similarity. If, if you're familiar with the index of occupational segregation, which has been used in gender a lot, is essentially one minus uh, that sort of thing. What it gives you is the proportion of men and women in, who would match up. You had even numbers of men and women in your sample, and you paired up all of the ones that scored the same. You know, so you answered uh, number two you know, on that, that categorical scale of, of risk preference. You scared, 
paired up all the men and women that answered two, all the women that men and women answered three, four, et cetera, uh, what proportion of uh, men and women would not match? And I have to give you another, I use this example with my class, because it's not just uh, sort of the uh, sexist folks that overstate and sometimes abuse statistics. Sometimes people do it uh, when they think they're doing women a favor. Um, a little quote from a, an article I saw. Oh, shoot, these things keep on getting cut off. The title of this is Work Stress Disproportionately Impacts Women. That's the title that's at the top of this that's cut off on the screen. Um, uh, from a study that found that 37% of women said they feel stressed, stressed at work uh, versus 33% of men. So stress is obviously a women's issue. 37% of women, 33% of men. If you calculate index of similarity, 96% uh, overlap between the men's and women's distributions <laughs> on workplace stress. Okay, so maybe workplace stress is a men's and a women's issue and not so distinctly uh, female. That gives you an example of that. Um, so what happens when we look at the risk uh, data? I showed you this plot when I introduced uh, gender differences at the aggregate level. Um, this is again these, uh, these investment advisors answered one through six. Um, the D for this comes out to be 0.4. This is one of the larger ones I found in my study of the economics literature on risk uh, and an index of similarity of only 0.7. So this is a, a case of relatively large difference that I found in this literature. What did I find in the literature overall? Um, I've written three papers on this, and so my, the charts I'm going to show you are coming from three somewhat different places. First, I looked at 35 different studies um, from the economics, uh, finance, and decision science literatures. And I calculated Cohen's D and uh, index of similarity when I could, when the data was categorical from each of these different studies. Uh, NSS there means not statistically significant, which means we couldn't reject the hypothesis that maybe there was no difference at all. Um, this was, uh, I think this is a subset of the 35 studies that I just chose to give an example I could put on one slide. But what you can see here is that some of the studies uh, found women um, taking more risks, that's what a negative sign means. Women, uh, on average, took more risks. Uh, the positive signs means men took more risks, not statistically significant, uh, uh, means essentially uh, we couldn't re reject zero. So a whole lot of these studies found at least some not statistically significant results. To the extent they found positive results in the expected direction of men taking higher risk taking, uh, most of these were, you know, around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 at the biggest. So are we talking about you know, the, the heights type distribution or are we talking about the overlapping distributions here? A D of about you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, something like that at the most. So we're talking about a great deal of, of overlap when we look at these. Uh, when we look at the index of similarity, again, uh, most cases 80% or more. One of the case, the case 0.67 there was actually a case uh, where women took more risks than men. Um, and there was relatively little overlap. But we see a lot of overlap coming from both the D, uh, low D values and high uh, index of similarity values. Um, some more recent work that I did, that I've done, I looked at um, how many different studies? Well, I've got three slides worth of studies here. <laughs> And I've started to calculate, actually STATA makes it really easy now also to do this, to calculate confidence intervals for the Cohen's uh, D uh, level. So what this means is that we're 95% confidence that this interval from minus, oops, minus 1.89 up to 0.54 contains uh, some population value from our sample. I ordered this table starting with the lower bound. That is, we can't reject the idea that perhaps women take more risks than men. Um, when all of those lower bounds uh, are negative. Uh, I'm listing um, oh, 37 studies that use the investment game um, uh, from a China's an easy piece on, uh, that, that was called Strong Evidence for Gender Differences in Risk Taking. But there, they had 37 studies. Um, these first 10 studies are essentially not statistically significant uh, differences. 
Uh, this is common language effect size there in that last column. You know, could you tell uh, whether um, uh, if you paired men and women, uh, would the men be taking more risks? Uh, the second, uh, the next 15 ones are also not statistically significant. Finally, the last um, uh, uh, 10 or so here, we get into statistically significant results in favor of uh, men being higher risk takers. Uh, the only case in which a uh, D value as high as two, I put in bold there. Uh, most cases, we would firmly reject um, uh, D value. This is a 95% confidence interval. We'd reject the idea that, that D could, uh, could be greater than uh, 1.5. So looking over a lot of studies, there's a whole lot of uh, not statistically significant difference, um, a few cases of statistically significant uh, differences. Um, the pool sample I'll, I'll get back to later, it's almost cut off at the bottom, that's about 1,800 observations uh, that went into, uh, went into that. Actually, I've got the next slide on that. So I took uh, all 37 studies, got the raw data from them, from the authors, piled it all together, which is a little bit suspect, it's not clear, they're all measuring the same thing, they use the same game, it's different populations, um, but just to see what would happen, uh, I came out with about half a standard deviation. Um, there's reason to suspect that this might have been a biased sample, which I'll get to again later on. But at most, we've got half a standard deviation of difference, and that would be statistically uh, significant. And this half, or half a standard deviation difference is what corresponds to this um, uh, plot that I showed you earlier. That there's a, a difference between the male and female mean investments, and here the axis is not cut off, uh, whether they invested uh, up to 100% of their uh, endowment in a risky asset. So the, that's a lot of statistics. Uh, you can also talk about, say, what percent of men and what percent of, of women uh, invested above a certain level, below a certain level. There's lots of other ways of communicating uh, this that have more sophistication to them than, than men take more risks than women, which is the generic statement, which is actually uh, untrue. Um, I think a handy metaphor can be worth whole piles of statistics. So we have the uh, Mars and Venus metaphor for uh, gender, categorical gender differences. Uh, someone else has quipped, uh, women are from North Dakota, men are from South Dakota. <laughs> and this, I think, is a good metaphor for uh, similarity and difference. There could be a difference in means, but there's a whole lot of overlap. Uh, men and women seem to be a lot more similar uh, than uh, rather than wildly different as from uh, different planets. So, now maybe this is all just innocent and that essentialist statement about women are more risk averse than men was just a shorthand and economists knew all along that uh, they were, it was a statistical case and they were doing rigorous uh, statistical uh, analysis. Um, one of the funny things is that while behavioral economists have started to investigate how uh, economic decision makers may make irrational choices, might be influenced by emotion and framing and everything else, uh, economists have continued to believe that we ourselves are totally neutral, unbiased, um, and rational, and don't have any of these things applying to ourselves. Uh, so there's very interesting literature out there on confirmation bias, which is the tendency to see to notice and believe evidence that confirms what we already believe, and the tendency to discount and not believe uh, stuff that doesn't. So if you come at this literature with the belief that men and women are essentially different, you're gonna tend to find that evidence. And if you'd run a study and it doesn't find that, well, you must have screwed up somewhere. It must just be a flawed study. I've heard anecdotal evidence from researchers in this field, that's exactly what happens. Well, we won't publish that one because something must have gone wrong. Uh, we didn't find the difference that we thought we were going to get. Um, so I did two, I have done two papers uh, looking at this in particular. Uh, the first one on the power of stereotyping and confirmation bias. Uh, took the information from the uh, first paper I did, narrowed it down to look only at uh, gender uh, risk preferences rather than um, risk perception, which is a somewhat uh, different issue. Looked only at the economics uh, uh, literature. 
and did some um, uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis of whether uh, people were reporting the stuff that seemed to be going, confirming stereotypes and tending to not report uh, or underplay things that didn't confirm stereotypes. So for example, I've got a lot of examples in those papers, uh, but let me just give you one or two. Uh, this graph, which I've now shown you three or four times, this was, again, one of the larger gender differences I found in my survey of the literature. The article was from uh, Beckman and, and Mankoff, uh, studied uh, preferences of investment advisors in four different countries. Uh, this is the graph for Italy, and this was the only case in which there was a statistically significant difference in the major question of interest. So three countries, no statistically significant difference at all between men and women. One country, uh, there was. The article concludes that there is a victory, quote, victory for gender difference, robust gender differences, and suggests that female investors should be paired with female investment advisors. That is, there is clearly a female investment style here, right, so that females should be matched with females and males with males. Now, again, if you've got that gender GDI in your head, that makes sense, but this is not what, what underlies this. There's not a distinctive style here. In fact, you can calculate from this exact data, if you uh, took a female, if female clients and female investors had the same distribution of preferences, you match a female client with a female investment advisor, you have a 37.5% chance of them matching up you know, on the same number scale. If you match them with the male, it goes down a little bit to 25%. Okay, but you're not gaining that much. You, you know, if you could just ask them their preferences, maybe that would be better than sorting them by sex as they come in the room. Okay. Um, they also found a statistically significant case in, on another question they looked at of women taking more risk, and they explained that away as women's greater preference for conformity. Um, so very, what I find rather bizarre uh, uh, interpretations of data uh, into, it's like they wrote the conclusions first and then did the study and didn't notice that the conclusions didn't, didn't match later on. Um, another statistical tool that comes from uh, uh, meta-analysis, um, some of what I'm doing is, is essentially meta-analysis, you're looking, so doing studies of studies, is something called a funnel diagram. And this gets kind of heavy into the statistics, uh, but a uh, really interesting way of trying to figure out Publication bias. Publication bias has to do with our only studies, you know, some subset of studies being published. Studies with statistically significant results being published and studies with no statistically significant result not being published, for example. Um, it's pretty common that you're only considered to actually have a result in something publishable if it's statistically significant. Um, or if uh, only certain signs or values of parameters you're estimating seem to be publishable. This is a, what a funnel diagram should look like just from theories of statistics. Um, what we've got is precision, one over the standard error. You can think of this as basically with sample size. Most of what's going on here is here we've got samples in the hundreds or maybe even thousands. Here we've got sample sizes down around maybe 30 or 50 or something like that. Well, just from the theory of statistics, if there is some true parameter out there you're trying to estimate, the distribution of values should peak around that. When you get a large sample, you should be pretty accurate getting to that true value. And when you get into smaller samples, you're going to be less accurate. So it's going to look like an upside down funnel. Less accurate in small samples, more accurate up there. Um, if people don't really have a presupposition about the sign, or if people disagree about what the sign should be, this is what you're likely to get. And if people will publish, even if they get not, not statistical significant results, it'll be filled in in the middle. If people don't publish results that are not statistically significant, it turns out to be hollow in the middle. But this is what it really should look like. But what if people have a prior expectation about what that sign of that value should be? For example, if you ever study microeconomic theory, you know that the own price elasticity of demand should be negative. Because otherwise, when the price of something goes up, you buy more of it. And that just generally doesn't make sense. Yeah. So Stanley and, uh, uh, did the name get cut off here? Oh, uh, Stas, um, their name, there's a citation that's all cut off on the screen. Stanley and a Greek name that I can't pronounce, Internal of Economic Surveys is where this is from. Um, price elasticities of water demand. 
If you look at published studies, this is what you get. A few brave souls got positive own price elasticities of demand and published them. But generally, those go against economic theory. They're not supposed to happen. What do you see? You see publication only of the negative side. And that flies in the face of statistical theory. It leads us, if you take statistical theory seriously, you know that there's a bunch of studies out here that simply didn't get published. They got put in a file drawer because they went against economic theory. Uh, so what do we see when we look at the gender and risk uh, uh, information? So here's my own uh, study. These are Cohen's D values on the horizontal axis. Uh, stereotypes would say that Cohen's D should be positive. That's men taking more risks than women. Uh, precision on the vertical axis. Uh, normally, uh, a normal is kind of an average sort of reporting. Emphasized is when people emphasize gender difference in a result, even though, for example, it's not statistically significant. So like that, some of these uh, black dots right in here are actually not statistically significant, but yet they became the headlines for the articles. And then downplayed are um, uh, results that either didn't get published. Like I said, I got micro data from some of these people. In some cases, they had data that they hadn't published from. Um, or that they, uh, they put in a footnote, or like in the, that Beckman and Menkoff piece where um, the women actually took more risks and they downplayed it as saying that women were just being more conformist. That's what I mean by downplay. So what do you see here? You see the most precise estimates, and I'll, oh shoot, there's actually two more dots above that that got cut off on the top of the screen. Um, I'm seeing them fine here. I don't know what's going on with the screen. But there's two more dots up there. So the most precise estimates are right in there. You see a lot over here to the right, positive sign, and you see a you know, fairly big hole there by comparison uh, on the side of women taking uh, more risks. And you see a lot of downplaying of the not statistically significant results, which is the ones you find right in the core there. I actually had to put this on two slides because the scale changes. Precision scale goes kind of wild. It's so another study found a whole range. And these were um, some studies with tens of thousands of uh, observations. So these, these two were from my same study, but I had to put them on two different scales so they didn't, uh, you could actually see the difference. If you take these, uh, the, the most precise estimates, the three from the last slide plus these, average them together, you get a Cohen's D value of about 0.13, a little over a tenth of a standard deviation as the uh, substantive size of the mean difference in risk aversion. Um, and I know it's a lot of statistics. And then this is the, oh, the title cut off is Strong Evidence for Gender Difference in Risk Taking. Uh, this is the article that I would characterize as being economic malpractice. Um, it was published in a leading journal in Behavioral Economics, 2012 Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. The authors claim a striking and consistent result over men's studies that men, uh, many studies that men choose to invest more in a risky asset than women. Um, several things wrong with this study. This is the data it's based on. That's the striking and consistent result that men take uh, more risks uh, than women. It's also this one. I showed you three slides of results. The first two slides was nothing statistically significant. Only the last slide showed any statistical significance. That's also the data they used for this study. Um, how did they claim to get a striking consistent result? They used a statistical test that would only be valid if there was no um, a standard deviation with zero within women and within men. I won't go into it, but they, they, they used a binomial test based on point estimates. They treated point estimates of difference as being uh, men taking more risks than women, even though they were uh, small and not statistically significant. Uh, they cherry picked their data uh, for inclusion. Uh, most of their data is data they generated themselves or with their co-authors. Didn't look too far. Uh, they excluded a study um, which went in the other direction, um, even though they took another study by the same people in the same year that went in their direction. Um, and then they did this really interesting thing with, with aggregation. Oh, uh, um, uh, they explicitly stated strong prior beliefs. Uh, they said, when a, w without any evidence, they stated, when a study finds that women are more risk-taking than men, in parentheses, quote, man bites dog, 
close quote. This study has a much higher chance of being published. Just they consider women taking more risk than men to be anti-species consistent behavior, although a human is biting a dog. They have no evidence for this. I found evidence for the other that um, it's the, the, the uh, studies that find uh, men take more risks are the ones that tend to get published. And they do this funny um, uh, aggregation thing. This is a funnel diagram for the studies that they did. Now what they reported are the dark dots. Where'd all the dark dots lie? <laughs> all but one of them to the right of zero. Their data, when I wrote to the authors of the studies they looked at, got the raw data, there's all these little circles, including a lot of circles where women uh, take more risk than men. What they did for some studies, the studies that agreed with them, was they reported uh, the data for individual treatments or studies. Where the data didn't agree with them, they aggregated these hollow dots with these hollow dots in order to get the uh, solid circles. They aggregated uh, the data together until the negative signs disappeared. And that became their strong evidence. And that just kind of pissed them off. Um, so that's uh, uh, where these, not, uh, the, my title of my critique on it is called Not So Strong Evidence uh, for Gender Differences in Risk Taking. And I'm just about out of time, so let me go on to just mention a few things that I would like to get into more. Uh, one of which I've gotten into a little bit. The other ones are uh, important things that I, I hope we'll hear more of uh, later on today and this evening. A uh, really nice uh, article uh, by Ripon, Jordan, Young, Kaiser, and Fine, a new article called Recommendations for Sex, Gender, and Neuroimaging Research, but also be good for behavioral economics research. Uh, one is to pay attention to overlap. And that's essentially all my, what my talk so far has been about. Uh, gender differences at categorical or individual level versus aggregate uh, or group level. Uh, contingency refers to context, for example, framing and priming effects. Uh, cultural, ethnic, national variation, intersectionality of sex, race, uh, class, etc. cetera. Um, at risk of what? Okay, this is all lottery studies, and yet it's been, uh, in, in fact, one of the articles um, related religiosity to uh, risk taking in terms of your risks about the afterlife. And they, they took a lottery study and tried to relate it to risks of the afterlife. Anyway, anyway. Um, so uh, broad ranging things. I did look at this a little bit in the articles. I didn't uh, play with this myself, but I noticed uh, that there's a number of psychology studies that play with uh, priming and framing uh, effects. So for example, in that this one, uh, the car and steel piece, they did a lottery type study, but uh, in one case they asked uh, subjects their gender before giving them uh, the, the experiment and described the experiment as a math problem would you choose this lottery or last lottery? In another case, they uh, asked people their gender after the experiment, and they described the experiment as a puzzle. Now here's Cohen's D values just between women. Women in what's called a stereotype threat case where they're asked gender and asked to do math, which is a, a, a goes against women's stereotype, uh, up to a full standard deviation. These are bigger, much bigger D values than we saw differentiating men and women. So here we've got women versus women being more different than men versus women uh, just from uh, a priming, you know, a framing effect. And similarly in, in some of these other studies. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into this one, but uh, this, this illustrates both the risk of what and um, contingency in terms of uh, class and, uh, and race. Um, what about the risk from high taxes? Turns out white males uh, fear that risk more than uh, women and minority males. Um, and in fact, uh, white males who have a hierarchical individual uh, cultural bent are the far outliers. Uh, minority men uh, and women uh, are, are in another lump. This is from um, uh, Dan Kayon. He did a blog post that he did in response to some of the stuff uh, that I've been doing. So yes, there's all sorts of other dimensions here. Uh, dimensions of what kind of risk we're talking about and who we're talking about. Uh, mosaicism is another thing that uh, this article on the neuroimaging points out. Uh, I have not done this in my research, but I think it's fascinating. I think we'll get into it some tomorrow. I'm just talking about one variable on a risk. Uh, but if you think about multivariate analysis, different kinds of behavior, it turns out there's not a whole lot of correlation among them. 
If we classify certain characteristics as being more masculine or feminine based on stereotypes or based on some difference in overall averages, um, you'll find that most people have a mix of things classified one or the other, and you'll find that the correlation is low. Scoring high and masculinity on one thing does not mean you'd score high uh, somewhere else. Um, and so this, you know, if we talk about multi multivariate, it gets even more uh, complicated. And then uh, entanglement, instead of nature versus nurture, there are ongoing reciprocal influences of biology and the environment and brain structure and function. I'm not the expert on that, but you've got another expert here, so I'm going to leave it at that, certain things to go on to. Um, I'm out of time, so my conclusion, that's a belief, and that's what we get from measurement. <laughs> <laughs>